Welcome to Just Around the Corner. This is a podcast that explores the lives of interesting people, examining the moments in their lives that encouraged and challenged them. And as a result, may their stories challenge and encourage your life for what's just around the corner for you. My guest today in episode two is Mr. Aaron Maben, a leader in the international security tech field, a former Green Beret, a husband and a father. His message is a message of hope and accomplishment for all of us. Today's episode is entitled, Husband, Father, Warrior. As a business coach, podcaster, and author, I invite you to subscribe to my newsletter by clicking on my website at dennismansfield.com on the landing page and hit the yellow button at the bottom of that page. I think you'll like it. I'm Dennis Mansfield. Thank you for joining Just Around the Corner with Dennis Mansfield. As John Hay, one of the most famous men of the 19th century once said, all the great prizes in life are just around the corner. Let's go there together. Well, welcome back to Just Around the Corner with Dennis Mansfield for episode two of my interview with Aaron Maben. Aaron is a businessman, he's an executive, he is a high-tech security professional and expert, and he is a former Green Beret, Special Forces. On episode one, we talked about the moments in his life that led to the opportunity for him to walk in a world of faith, following Christ, seeing his own life uh, open up and change. Episode two is about the specifics of those times uh, as a member of the Special Forces. So, Aaron, again, welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, let's pick it up. Uh, you went into basic training, and you said, I'd like to go SF. Mm -hmm. When the recruiter said, sign right here, was there ever a doubt in your mind that you were going to be a Green Beret? It was really a opportunity to show what I was capable of. And so it didn't matter whether I earned the tab or not. It was about going and showing what I can do. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is that benevolent detachment of saying, I am going to go and I'm going to try, and even if I fail, at least I won't be part of those cold, timid souls that nice. neither know victory nor defeat. And I tell you, when uh, Theodore Roosevelt spoke about that at the Saban in France, it was a very, I mean, it was the man in the, in the arena. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly find yourself in the arena of international warfare. But let's, before we get into that, let's talk about your training period because there are a lot of people that say Green Beret, SEALs, what, what is all that? Mm -hmm. And which branch of service is it? And what are you, so you were a Marine, right? No, I was in the Army. Uh, help the viewer or the listener understand what a Green Beret is. Yeah, so when we look at this aspect, Every branch of the military has its own special operations capability. And so when we look at the Army, there's actually multiple units in uh, U.S. Army special operations. There's the Green Brace or Special Forces. There's the Army Rangers. And then you also have things like uh, psychological operations and civil, uh, not civil affairs, I'm trying to remember what the CA is for, but those all belong to USASOC and they all have different functions. In Navy, you're most familiar with the Navy SEALs, and that's part of uh, Naval Special Warfare. And then in the Marines, they have the Raiders, which are similar to the Army Rangers. Any Marines, if I'm saying this wrong, please forgive me, because I don't know the Marines as well, but I don't want to <laughs> make them go, that's BS! <laughs> I don't want to get it wrong either. Well, but then you also just, have... <laughs> just, simply just simply choose them off and set a time for a wrestling match and we'll see who's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, and so, and then you also have the MARSOC, mm -hmm. uh, which would be very similar to the Green Berets uh, in the Marines. And then in the Air Force, they have some other special operations. You've got the PJs, which specialize in search and rescue. Um, they usually attach to other special operations units in other uh, branches. Mm -hmm. You also have combat controllers. They're the ones that are uh, laying waste 
with fire from the sky, also attached to other special operations units. And those guys, <laughs> they definitely make a force multiplier. And so you've got these different capabilities within the special operations of these different branches. And so what makes special forces or the Green Berets unique was that our focus is on what's called unconventional warfare. And so what that means is in layman's terms, we're supposed to be able to go into a country that is likely hostile mm -hmm. to US interests. We would connect with a insurgent force in that country and help build them up into a fighting force to help fight against an oppressive government. In how, fact, how, how do you how do you even train for that? I mean, the military brings you in, they go through basic training, mm -hmm. advanced infantry training, and then you suddenly are in this world that says, oh, all those things that we told you about with order and angles and no, it's different. We're gonna put you into a world where you're dealing with insurgents that are not a military force. Correct. But are a guerrilla force. Yeah, well, and they may just be civilians, right? Could they, be. they may, they may Could just be. be people that were, that are being oppressed and are trying to resist an oppressive government because they want their freedom, they want their liberty, right? And so when we look at it from that perspective, not only do we need to be, as Green Berets, masters of the basics mm -hmm. because we have to train infantry basics to this militia, to this in indigenous force. We also be, have to understand logistics. And so there's these functions in the military, they, they go by number. So in the army, you've got things like S1 shop, which is for personnel. You've got um, S3 shop, which is for operations. You've got your S6 shop, which is for communications. And Really, those are the logistical functions that typically your your standard uh, infantryman isn't going to be as involved in. They're more focused on drilling and training and being able to um, implement their infantry tactics. Well, within special forces, you also have to be able to handle those other functions and build those functions within this indigenous force. So not only are you training and drilling mm -hmm. on tactics and raising up a fighting capability, but you're also dealing with implementing medica medical capabilities, mm -hmm. implementing personnel and recruiting capabilities, implementing uh, psychological operations and, and getting the word out there for mm -hmm. the, uh, and that would go more to the PSYOP side, but mm -hmm. still working with those types of teams in that environment. And then just being able to build up that force to actually be a legitimate option against the oppressive government. How long is the training for it? So uh, it depends on what your milita military occupational specialty is, or MOS, mm -hmm. basically just means job in the military. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it's a weapons specialist, a engineering specialist or a communication specialist, typically the training is about a year to a year and a half. Um, if you're a medical specialist, you actually go through a special operations combat medic course where you're basically a, the equivalent of a PA mm -hmm. <laughs> afterwards, um, but able to implement that type of medicine in the field effectively. And that adds on an extra year to the pipeline. So, so a person wanting to become a member of special forces of wearing the Green Beret it is really, they're committed, they're committing to a prolonged period of time. Correct. Now, you also go to jump school, mm -hmm. and that's typically how long? Uh, airborne school is only like three, three, three weeks, three four weeks. weeks. Uh, some go to ranger school. Some do. And that is an additional period of time that they commit to. It is. <clears throat> But the vast majority are focused on their special forces time, getting that done so they can then be deployed out into the field. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting aspects of special operations within uh, the Army. Um, there was an opportunity for me, once I learned about the Green Berets, to, as a, with, a uh, with a college degree, I could go in and have a direct pathway to try out for special forces. And so that included uh, infantry, school, or it's called OSET, one station unit training. But it's infantry training, then airborne school, and then selection for special forces to continue training in the, what's called the qualification course. 
<laughs> and so that's my pathway into it. However, the Army, anyone in the Army, down to cooks, can try out for selection and become special operations, can become a Green Beret. And in fact, I was buddies with guys that started out in those other positions or maybe not even you know combat positions that came in, tried out, and served. Or in their tab and served. What was it like when you graduated and you were given your tab you were, and you put your beret on? What was it like for you personally? Because you, you were married. Mm-hmm. You were going all through this time period with two little boys and a little girl on her way. Yep. Yeah. In fact, she was born, I think, while you were in training. That is correct. And when that happened, I will... We'll put up uh, um, a photograph of you holding your daughter <laughs> so that those who could see, you were involved in training yourself while your bride was training your daughter. Yep. How did that work for you? It was a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, being unavailable, um, even by my wife's bedside, I was studying for a test uh, for the next morning. So it was at that point where contractions uh, were close enough together where she grabbed my wrist and said, it's time to put that down. Because oh <laughs> I you know, was studying, you know, hey, how you doing? Okay, good. You know, <laughs> trying to balance these priorities, right? Yeah. And, and, but, you know, the birth of my daughter was so wonderful, but yeah. it wasn't without its challenges and hiccups. I mean, God's fingerprints were all over the situation. Yeah telling me and reminding me that it's not I who am doing this, it's him. Yeah. And we got to see that throughout, from, from beginning to even when I left the military. You're, you're involved in the military. You're involved in um, essentially a school for soldiers for the opportunity for the civilian mind. They, they, a lot of times people go, no, you're kind of like a police force, right? You kind of help people move along. But the reality is that uh, as a member of the special forces, your task, uh, as in any combat arms, was in, if needed, to terminate the lives of other people. And that, that our freedom isn't just something that's cavalierly given to us. Mm-hmm. It's oftentimes things that we have to struggle with blood, sweat, toil, and tears, and hopefully it's the blood of the other guy and not us that allows us to have that freedom, to carve out that freedom right. to continue on. You, you became pr- very proficient in all aspects of your training. Did you ever in your Christian thinking, have a conflict with the idea that you would have to take lives? It was definitely something that was there in the back of my mind. And in fact, when I was going, once I had gotten selected, you give your preference for what type of job you want. And because I had already done some IT work before going into the military, I was like, well, if I'm going to be required to take life, I'd also like to be able to save life. And so I had an interest in going the medical route. Um, But because of my IT background, they said, nope, you're going to do communications. Mm -hmm. And it worked out very well. So looking at that aspect where you have force on force and you are faced with the requirement to take life, it's it's something that you have to come to accept. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to follow through with those orders and, and it's required. And I had accepted that knowing that I was fighting for what's right, and that is freedom and liberty. Mm-hmm. When we look at it from that perspective, if I am in a combat operation and I understand what the target is, what the mission is, then I also can understand that and put that with the bigger picture yeah. and say, okay, here's what are the outcomes of this? How do we need to work through that? And how do I need to prepare my mm-hmm. own heart for the event of this, mm. this being taken in another scenario. person's life, right? Yes, um, we we understand that. My wife and I understand that because, as you know, our youngest son um, was deployed to the Middle East and was a uh, uh, an officer. Um, at that point, he was a first lieutenant and getting ready to become a captain. And something very unique happened uh, with you and me. I received a phone call from you. Yep. And 
I had no idea where you were in the world. You don't go about telling people where you were. Right. Operational and, security. Correct. And so you asked me one question and it involved whether my son was by the water or not by the water. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew something was up, but I didn't know what. And I remember where I was standing and I said, by the water. And you said, Roger that, and you hung up. What happened? Um, so I, I asked for his, his contact information and you gave it to me. And after that conversation, I reached out and said, hey, you might be in the same vicinity as me. And we, we talked about it and said, yep, hey, here's where I'm at. You should come visit. And so I had the opportunity to run and, and visit him. And we took a picture outside of his uh, <laughs> building and, and sent that over to you. It and was, it was the quite a surprise. <laughs> <He> was, <laughs> to receive this phone call out of the stratosphere, God, I, I have no idea where you were. <laughs> and then within, I don't know, a few hours, yep. the photo lands. And I go, wait, what? Aaron, how did how did you how did you do that voodoo? <laughs> and there was Colin. Yeah. The question I have, obviously, you've known Colin since he was a young boy. Yep. And suddenly you go in, but you're an enlisted man. Yes, and your son was an officer. Did you salute him? I did. <laughs> well, actually, technically, no, I didn't because I was in civilian clothing. Oh, that's I didn't right. have to. Yes. <laughs> but I would have. You would have. <laughs> what a fun thing that was because he has such great respect for you as as I uh, for him. You know, and, and I know that to be the case. And you both ended uh, your military careers and and moved and moved back into the civilian world. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about with your bride and your daughter. You you. In Countered some physical things that you had no experience ab about. Suddenly, you've got a wife and now a daughter that both have similar physical mm -hmm. needs. Walk us through that and how your faith in Christ, where, look, I served you, I did all this stuff, but now I've got to confront this. Yeah. So, one of the things that we um, experienced, so my wife she has a genetic condition called cystic fibrosis. And so she is obviously a carrier of that gene. And so if I were to be a carrier of the gene, any offspring that we have would have a 50% chance of also being born with cystic fibrosis. I had no idea if I had, if I was a carrier of that gene. We were married. We were going through, I was had some setbacks in getting into the uh, Special Forces pipeline. And as I had finally gotten selected and gone through um, the phase called Introduction to Unconventional Warfare, we, I was in holding, which means, you know, you're waiting to go into training and you're meeting up every morning showing that you're still there, you're still available, and then you get assigned tasks. Mm -hmm. And one of the tasks that I got assigned was going to be a point sitter for the land navigation. If you haven't uh, seen uh, Two Weeks in Hell uh, by the Discovery Channel, it's a good example of what Special Forces assessment and selection looks like. And so you can get, get a feel for what land navigation was as part of that training. And so in order to support that land navigation training, you need to have people at points where they're navigating to, mm -hmm. to be point sitters. Mm -hmm. And so before that, we found out that we were going to have our daughter. Um, we didn't know if I was a carrier of the gene, so we figured, you know what, we should go find out. Mm -hmm. And we got the input back that I was a carrier and that our daughter would have a 50-50 chance. Mm -hmm. And then we went and got an amniocentesis so we could determine if for sure she had it or not um, in utero. And right before I was about to be tasked out to be a point sitter, we got the phone call saying, your daughter's gonna be born with cystic fibrosis. She has cystic fibrosis. And then 10 minutes later, I got on a bus. I was away from my wife for a week, point sitting in, in the woods mm -hmm. without cell coverage. Mm -hmm. And just at this point breaking down of man, what, am I, what are we gonna do with this? Mm -hmm. And I just remember God telling me, I wouldn't give it to you if I didn't 
think you could handle it. I, I have this and you have this. I'm going to strengthen you and, and you are going to be able to do this. And what we experienced has been just a mighty blessing because when I was dating my wife, she was actually going through a clinical trial for medication for cystic fibrosis that really performs wonders. It, it turned out to be a miracle drug. Mm. And, and it's actually made cystic fibrosis livable for like 95% of the community. Well, the great news is, is that my daughter was getting that same medication in utero. And so as she was born, we had a stint where she wasn't getting that medication because it hadn't been approved for that young of an age. But we, we were working through it and she was happy and healthy once we got her um, the enzymes that she needs for digestion. But it was still, that was a thing that was over the whole experience, right? It was something that was part of the experience that we had to work through. But it also kind of put in the back of my mind that this would likely be a one uh, enlistment mm -hmm. term versus continuing my career in the military. After Sloan was born, how much longer did you um, So she was born as I was in the communications course. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, we also had the um, SEER school, we had language, and we had the final ac exercise, the FTX, for, that's called Robin Sage. Again, uh, you can look that up on Wikipedia, it's pretty interesting. What language did you study? So, um, my, much like we get a option to give our top three for job function, we also get the option to choose um, or top, give our top three for language or our top three for where we want to be stationed. Mm -hmm. And because um, first Special Forces group was based out of Washington State, um, I wanted to be stationed there, sure. which would put me in the uh, PACOM uh, or Pacific Command arena. And the um, other aspect is, you know, if you get your choice of station, they'll assign you the language that they deem they need. Mm -hmm. And so I was assigned Thai, oh. of all things. Is so that, that right? was pretty interesting. <laughs> Did you become pretty fluent in it? Um, so <coughs> I was relatively fluent in it going through language school. So they have native speakers as the professors and you're just speaking it the whole time. I haven't. You're learning about the culture, you're getting to just immerse yourself in learning this language. And then the exam, they've got two different types of exams. One is like a written computer or a computerized test where you're doing uh, listening and reading. And then you've got the oral proficiency uh, interview where you're actually speaking and listening with a, another native speaker and they're judging your proficiency. So I was able to get pretty good scores in my first uh, oral proficiency interview, um, but I just never really got the opportunity to really yeah. leverage it or get immersed in, what an incredible, in country. What an incredible <laughs> opportunity for yeah. you. Now it's a, a vision that John Kennedy had from the start mm -hmm. because although 19... 45, 44, 45, um, the, the, the whole idea of um, special forces would come out of World War II, uh, there were certain key people that picked up on things. It was really John Kennedy in 61 that uh, I, I came across something that was fascinating to read. It says, though they had been worn unofficially, it wasn't until a visit to Fort Bragg, North Carolina by President John Kennedy in 61 that the Green Beret was made the official headgear of the Army Special Forces. Kennedy decreed that the Green Beret was, quote, a symbol of excellence, a badge of courage, a mark of distinction in the fight for freedom. Well, that's a pretty heady thing to have the President of the United States say, yes, mm -hmm. I want that. I want that designation for these men. And quite frankly, from my reading up on it, there had been some uh, anger within the army about anything special being there for berets or anything else. And it was Kennedy that decreed it, the Department of Defense that approved it immediately, and the Department of the Army that implemented it. So that from 61 on to your, when, when did you exit the Green Berets? What year was it? So I left active duty service in 2017, mm -hmm. but I also continued for two more years in the National Guard. Yeah. So there are a couple of uh, special forces groups 
that are National Guard. So you can actually be a Green Beret and still have a mm -hmm. civilian career. So I thought that was pretty interesting that those were available. And so I served in 19th Group, and that was out of Salt Lake. Yeah, not, not unusual, though uh, it was in the Pacific um, area to be able to have to travel to yep. wherever you'd have to do your, your time as a, as a civilian doing military work. Right? Yep, for sure. So, so let's, let's uh, do a quick recap before we come in for a close. Yeah. Uh, your daughter and your wife are, are healthy. Happy and healthy. And the medicine is helping them tremendously. And the medicine is helping tremendously. It's actually incredible how big of a blessing that's been. H how old is Sloan now? Sloan is 10. And your sons are how old? I have an point? adult son. I, I have an 18-year-old who graduates. Like I am, I am entering midlife <laughs> as I have an adult son, which is quite 18. interesting. And then a 15-year-old. So two boys that what, are driving. What are your son's names so that we make sure? Shane that, and Siler. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I've got to tell you, as a as a father, and now of course as a grandfather, uh, when I look at your family, and I see where you were all those years ago to where you are now, it gives me great joy because you were always a warrior. It just so happened that you went in the Army. Yeah. It just so happened that you went into Special Forces and got a Green Beret. It just so happened that you served on deployments and did all that you did because you were always a warrior. And one of the things that uh, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, these two episodes uh, hopefully will have encouraged you on is that you can choose to be a warrior in whatever field you're in. In Aaron's case, he has uh, transferred all of the energies of who he was in Christ into who he was as a warrior for Christ, who he was, who he became as a warrior for the United States uh, Army, and then ultimately who he is as a warrior in industry and commerce. And so, where you are, what you're doing in your life, uh, you're there for such a time as this. It was Mother Teresa who said that there are no great things. There are only small things done greatly. And so my encouragement and Aaron's encouragement to you is whatever thing you're doing, small or medium sized, do it greatly. Be a warrior. Love the Lord God with your whole heart, soul, spirit, and mind, and walk in Him. If you haven't signed up for His service, He's only a prayer away. Just as Aaron did and I did in our lives, this might be the moment for you to make the decision to ask Him to enter your life and equip you for the future, because the future is wonderful. Even if it's going to be difficult, it's wonderful. Yeah.